Good evening, all. Welcome back to the Captainizer Podcast. We've got an awesome episode tonight. Tonight, our guest is Dr. Catherine Plua, and she's pretty awesome. Uh, pretty interesting uh, how we met. Uh, yeah, I was going to go speak at a psychedelic conference <laughs> as a retired chief of police. People are like, what? Psychedelic conference? What are you doing? And uh, maybe we can touch on that a little bit, but there is some pretty cool research that's coming out on uh, nootropics and different, different, uh, really just new therapies for treating PTSD. And I was actually going to talk about metabolic health, but anyway, it, it's more of a tension grabber if I, if I say the chief was going to talk at the psychedelic conference, but <laughs> a good welcome, intro. <laughs> welcome to the show, Dr. Kat. Thank you, Pat. It's great to be here. Uh, and just for the record, I'm not doing psychedelics uh, as we discuss this. I'm retired now. So, you know, if I chose to do that, um, I would just have to make sure that it's legal in my state. I think some states it's legal, but I digress. So uh, Things are doc- changing. <laughs> yeah, they are changing. And you know what? Sometimes for the better, uh, but most of the time for 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 the. Well, I should say sometimes for the worse, but most of the time for the better. But uh, Dr. Kat has got a pretty amazing background. Uh, She's a researcher and consultant. She works in digital health. Uh, She's got seven years of research and 10 years of clinical experience in diagnostics. And she's a diagnostics and biometrics expert working across healthcare, pharmacy, fitness, and industry to improve human and organizational performance. And that's Obviously, one of the things that we love to talk about on this show is is peak performance and human performance and how we get a little bit better. And uh, her research is focused on improving health and safety standards in sports, workplaces, uh, as well as improving health outcomes uh, through remote patient monitoring and rehabilitation programs. She is the founder of a leading stress research firm that works with organizations to proactively address stress in the workplace and make people healthier, safer, and more productive in that workplace. And I think now we're starting to see the relevance. There's no stress in public safety, is there, Dr. Kat? <laughs> none at all. What are you talking about, Pat? <laughs> yeah, none at all. You're right. Yeah, we uh, we all hire healthy. We retire healthy. We live to be 100 and uh, we're super productive in between. Uh, That's right. Wouldn't that be the dream? <laughs> that, you know, that is the dream. And one of the things I'm going to ask you about later is if if we were going to build Super Cop, how would we do it? Uh, how would we build Super Cop? But before we get to that, yeah, over the years, she has worked with various groups and people, including high performing athletes, law enforcement officers, military personnel, veterans, and as well as patients with neurological disorders. And she's passionate about human health and optimization and loves to explore the blend of new and old techniques and techniques to help people adapt to stress and unlock new levels of performance. She has a PhD in biomedical engineering from the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Toronto, uh, an MS in kinesiology from the University of Western Ontario, a BS in kinesiology. Uh, and it's important to note, graduated summa cum laude, right? That's right. I, I always like to point out when, when you earned it, right? Uh, that's from that's right. uh, Mc, McMaster University. And uh, I, th- you know, a whole other list of things. So <laughs> that, that's, that's quite the impressive resume. So people are going to be wondering, like, why are you on this guy's show? <laughs> <laughs> well, Our journey brought us together. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm none of those things. You know, I'm a, uh, I'm a former cop. Uh, happened to be a chief for a while, but no, I, I do really appreciate your time. Uh, I'm going to be uh, very, uh, very respectful of your time. We're going to try to keep this show right around an hour. But when we were chatting before we, before we went live here. It's hard to do sometimes when you meet somebody that's so passionate about what they do. And so first of all, I just have to say thank you for spending some time with us. Uh, we're looking forward to some of the things that that you're going to share. And, and just, a, just a little teaser for the audience. Uh, I said it in the beginning in her, in her bio, she was talking about digital health. 
And I'm a big fan of technology. Anyone that knows me knows that. Uh, but it really is only as good as the way we apply it. And so technology is is pretty cool. There's some new things coming, but there also, it, it raises a lot of questions about what we can and can't do, what we should and should not do. But we're gonna you're, we're gonna push the uh, the envelope a little bit, maybe in a discussion about HRV uh, heart rate variability. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. We'll talk a little bit about it. But and and for cops in particular, wearables and wearable sensors, you know things that uh, you know where the technology is today, where it might take us to tomorrow. Uh, not only I, I think from a, a personal and individual performance perspective, but how do we stay healthy? But how could we do our jobs better? Uh, how could we be uh, better public servants? So that's that's kind of what we want to talk about. And, um, you know, really just, you know, just exercise and nutrition and some of these things uh, that, that you do in your professional life and how it might help us in public safety. So I'll shut Excellent. up for a minute. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Pat, for the excellent introduction. Um, as I said, you know, our journey kind of weaved us uh, to to meet each other in a, in an interesting way, but we connected about the digital health. I mean, I remember our first conversation, we were talking about how can we use various types of sensors to monitor stress levels and health levels of police officers and uh, you know, like you said in my intro there, I have worked with some police officers, some law enforcement in the in the past. It was before really I was using uh, sensors in a regular basis for organizations. We were kind of before those times, before wearables were really a thing. But, you know, we were talking about how can we improve people's um, health, their fitness, their stress levels in the law enforcement field, in the industry, not just from the, you know, the SWAT teams or the guys who are the officers going out into these traumatic, high emotional ex uh, experiences in the field, but also to people who are the administrators, who are taking the phone calls, who are making the dispatches, who are working in all of those other roles as well in the law enforcement industry as well. So um, when I was doing that training, we were running basically an employee wellness training uh, over the course of a year. It was um, my classmate and I, and we were straight out of our uh, our undergrads, basically at the end of our undergrads, both studying kinesiology, super excited about how we can apply this into the real world. And then we got this uh, we got this experience to actually work with law enforcement. So it was an eye opener to take what we had learned in school and actually apply it to the real world and bring some of those new ideas that we were learning about, new things that we thought were really relevant, especially kind of coming from an athletic perspective, right? Because a lot of what we had learned focused on athletic principles, exercise physiology, uh, injury prevention, injury rehab from an athletic performance perspective. And then we were looking at how, or we were learning about how those same principles can be applied to patient populations, to aging populations. How can we apply those to the workplace? My A lot of my studies was focused on biomechanics and ergonomics, so understanding how we can make the workplace safer, how we can prevent injuries from happening in the workplace, how we can rehab people, people better in the workplace as well. And so I really started to kind of take those athletic principles that I was learning and then apply them into the workplace. And that was when I really got interested in, you know, working with organizations because I was seeing that if we kind of applied those same principles to an industrial athlete type of mentality, then we could really improve not only people's health in the workplace, their safety, we could reduce the risk of injury, we could reduce the severity of injury when people were better trained, when they had better muscle strength, better endurance, they were less likely to get those repetitive injuries, for example. And if they did sustain an injury, they were more likely to bounce back a lot faster. So I'm like, well, how do we apply this to more organizations? Not just the manufacturing organizations where a lot of the ergonomics work was focused, but how can we apply this to everywhere else? So that's been kind of my mission in starting enterprise stress management. Um, to bring some of those principles into the workplace, because I know that humans have all of this potential. We And the missing piece is the education, the literacy about that. So teaching people about it, training people on it. And like you said, 
you know, we have these great sensors, we have these great tools. And one of the gaps that I see is really bringing that education, bringing that literacy to people so that people know how to use them and they can use them. And that's one of the things that we see actually with remote patient monitoring. So we have these great studies uh, using the latest and most innovative technologies. Companies and hospitals are paying millions of dollars to run these studies. And some of the biggest downfalls with them is that the patients don't know how to use the tools and then they don't end up collecting the data. So some of these studies end up being these big wastes of money because the patients are not trained how to use the technology, how to connect their smartphone to it, how to record the data. They're missing that part of it. And that can be up to 50% of the problem in a lot of the studies. So um, well, you know, hey, real, bringing real, that education to it is one of the solutions. So real quick for, for the listeners who don't know what remote, remote, uh, remote patient monitoring is, Maybe yep. maybe a quick explanation, uh, because I, I think during COVID, everybody kind of got uh, a real quick uh, crash course on, well, maybe Hello? maybe being in, uh, in person isn't always going to be the best or only way to do things. So we can do telehealth, but remote patient monitoring really takes that uh, to a whole new level uh, through sensors. Yeah, so great question. So if we if we kind of take a step back, you had mentioned digital health um, previously. So if we take a step back and look at what are digital health technologies, they are basically uh, mobile phones, smartphone applications, as well as sensors that can be used to collect various health data. And these can be then integrated, they can be sent to the doctor's office, they can be sent to clinics, doctors can run reports off of them, and they can track your health at a distance through digital sources. So again, using things like smartphones, using things like sensors that connect to smartphones, or using things like um, uh, smartphone applications to then collect data. So if we kind of look at various um, sort of buckets within those we can have things like fitbit watches i know you wear a whoop watch as well so you collect your own data and that collects various types of physiological data so what can we measure with these different types of sensors with the fitbit for example we can measure things like your heart rate your respiratory rate there's an accelerometer in it so it tracks your activity levels through the day your steps things like that it can calculate your energy expenditure so how much energy are you burning throughout the day through your movements based off of your body shape and size. Um, we can use that to then tra track and correlate what your nutrition levels are. So then you're able to put your nutritional input into that as well using the smartphone app. So you can track your nutrition. You can see if you're in an energy balance with what you're eating versus what you're expending throughout the day. So this is helpful for people to not only track what their own health is, uh, they can track their sleep patterns as well, but then it also can be sent to the doctor's office and then the doctor can get an insight into how this their patient is actually doing when in those times when they're not actually at the doctor's office, because when a patient comes into the doctor's office, maybe they get some really advanced tests done, but you have to think about that test only shows one moment in time. It's just a snapshot of what happens. So being able to collect long-term data over longer periods of time gives a lot of insights into how patients are doing outside of those doctor's offices. And often, you know, if you um, are having issues with your heart, you may get prescribed to wear a Holter monitor. So that will put a device on you to monitor your heart, your ECG, your the electrical patterns of your heart over a 24-hour period of time. And what the doctors are looking for there are, are um, discrepancies in those signal. Um, what are some variations to what a normal ECG pattern looks like? And that can give us information on specific diagnostic criteria um, and can help make those types of clinical decisions. But if you only take that snapshot over a short period of time, you may miss those data points. So that's where remote patient monitoring comes in, where we create sensors that can collect data, health data, over much longer periods of time that patients or people can wear uh, on a daily basis. They can wear them over a week time, depending on the type of device or the type of sensor that it is. And then they're able to send that uh, information 
information to their doctor's office, or they themselves are able to track their own health patterns and be able to see how changes in their exercise, changes in their behaviors are then impacting their health. So it's really important to empower the patients and get the patient involved in their own care. Wow. So, yeah, so much there. And so the, much. <laughs> yeah, I know. But this is what this is why, again, an hour will be tough. So if, if you know, if you're if you're a police officer and you're working the midnight shift um, and you're tired all the time, there's probably a good reason for it <laughs> because you're not getting any sleep. Right. That's the main thing. But right. if when you understand that, uh, like, all right, now I, I know I have to work nice. I know, you know, human beings were were not, you know, they didn't evolve staying up at night. So I'm go- I'm going to be running against counter to nature. So what's something that I can do to help me manage, uh, you know, this this uh, working environment that I'm going to have to be in for a period of time? So data is really what you're talking about. We're capturing data and we can, we can, as individuals, we can look at this data and we can begin to understand how this is affecting us, uh, you know, in a positive way or perhaps in a negative way. But the, the data now is also empowerment because now we can see how things are affecting us and we can take active measures, active steps, and we can try things to see if it's going to move things in a positive direction or in a direction where we don't want to go. And I've got a lot of examples of that. And I'll, I'll try to just uh, for brevity's sake, um, one of the things uh, that we do uh, at our police department is we do a comprehensive blood test. And you know, when you when you look at uh, for listeners, there, most most people in the policing world are familiar with Dr. Gil Martin's work. Um, I've had the pleasure of presenting with him at uh, FOP, uh, the National Wellness Conference. But he, you, you know, his, you know, he, his emotional survival for law enforcement book is, you know, it's kind of like the, you know, it's one of the pinnacles of work in policing. And it really talks about all the emotional stressors and how that can impact your health. Uh, not in not only in the short term, but in the long term, you know, ultimately how that affects your your professional performance, your you know, your your personal life, all these things. Um, and for a long time, there wasn't any discussion about your your physical health and how your physical health impacts emotional health. Well, you know, we started doing this test and and Dr. Gil Martin is is friends with Dr. Greenwald and Dr. Bill Cromwell and uh you know, we call it the police panel where we're looking at biomarkers in the blood. And of course, one of the things that we found through, through doing these lab work uh, was that uh, about 60% of the police population is insulin resistant and doesn't know it, um, which is kind of scary, right? Um, yeah. If you don't know what insulin resistance is, you, uh, stay tuned to other podcasts or you can go back and listen to uh the podcast with Matt Martin and and we're going to have future guests on to talk more about that and why it's so important, especially for police officers. But, you know, the point being is that the, you know, when you're trying, when you're talking about behavior change and, you, and you're talking about programs and things that can move you in the right direction or the wrong direction, you have to have a baseline. You have to know where you are uh, and you have to know what your risks are. And then once you know what your risks are and you, what your baseline are, and it, you know, it, your baselines are now you can, again, take those steps to to manage if things are going to be helpful or not. So, you know, our presentation that we did, we, we call it the blood, the blood doesn't lie. And we did that to really just kind of highlight the fact that, you know, we as people <laughs> tend to tell stories to ourselves that we want to hear and that we want to believe. Uh, but as investigators, in, and that's a big part of what we do in the, in the policing world is, is the, we're the seekers of truth. Uh, to find justice. Sometimes we don't do ourselves uh, any personal favors because we kind of tell ourselves the stories, you know, when it comes to sleep, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Right. Um, right. You know, I'll eat healthy later when I have time. And uh, right. But, you know, when you when you show some when you give somebody a comprehensive blood test and you look at these seven lines of data and you show them, OK, here's your eight year cardiometabolic risk. That, yep. you know, for some people, when they see things that are in, you know, we and we do it simply, like, 
green light, yellow light, red light, you know, green is good. Yellow is cautionary. Red, you got some things you need to work on. And uh, it could be like hard stop, red light, like, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're at serious risk. And, you know, but blood tests are, you know, that's something that you can only do every three months, six months, you know, you've got to give things time to see how it's, you know, if you're making a mm -hmm. nutritional change, you know, how it's going to impact things down the road. Wearables, you know, that's a little bit different story. And, you know, now you talk about, if you're going to talk about insulin resistance, one of the things that immediately comes to mind is, okay, well, what about a, a continuous glucose monitor, you know, which were developed for uh, primarily for diabetics, but now we realize, well, this is a much bigger problem, not just in, in, you know, in, in the world, particularly in the United States or in Western cultures, but really a big problem in the policing culture. Um, mm -hmm. So, wow. What if, what if, what if we issued an officer, a continuous glucose monitor and we gave them an app and every day they get to see what their, what their blood sugar looks like um, and now if they're working a midnight shift and they're, and they're feeling tired and, uh, and out of sorts, well, now they can see, well, geez, on these days that I'm working or days that I'm not getting good recovery, um, I feel terrible, but look, you know, my blood sugar levels are like in the, in the 110, one in the one twenties. Well, that's, that's diabetes, you know, diabetes level, uh, pro problems there. So, and and yeah, then you're able time. to modify. Yeah, that's real time. That's real time data of how your body's actually functioning. And one of the things that I've kind of um, learned over the years, I mean, I've worked uh, in a healthcare setting for about 10 years in a neurodiagnostics clinic. So exactly what you're talking about with, you know, running those tests and giving people the data because the data doesn't lie. This is exactly what I did in the neurology clinic. So I'm actually an EMG technologist where I would basically put some sensors on people's nerves and test how their nerves are functioning. And then we can tell if a person has carpal tunnel, if they have an ulnar neuropathy, if they have sciatica, or if they have other specific neurological disorders or dysfunctions. So we're physically testing how the nerves are working. I'm running the test and I'm seeing the waveforms right on the screen. And then I can, you know, take the symptoms from the patient. I can look at those symptoms and I can say, well, you're describing these types of symptoms. And sometimes people are really good at describing their symptoms and they can say, this is exactly what I feel. And I feel it exactly at this time when I do this type of a movement, it causes this type of a symptom. And then I can run my test and I can see how their symptoms are correlating with the data. And then I'm able to explain to the patient and actually show them on the graph what is happening. And that I found through my work was one of the big things to actually improve patient outcomes as well. When I was able to show them what's happening, they were able to understand where the problem is, what's causing the problem. And then they would come back for their follow-up and they're like, yeah, I followed your instructions. It made sense. I saw the, the results right away, or I saw the results after a period of time. But then some patients are not able to describe those things. Some patients kind of have symptoms all over the place. And it's harder to get those patients to actually make that change, make those, you know, behavioral changes, for example, to improve their symptoms. So being able to run that test gives you the ability to look at the data to see if there is a physical problem with the nerve or is that nerve or those symptoms, are they coming from someplace else? And then you can at least kind of like diagnostically eliminate some of those symptoms and then go searching for them. Maybe they're actually coming from more of an emotional or a stress reaction because stress can cause a lot of different symptoms for people. And some people are better at distinguishing those things. And some people are not so great at distinguishing those, those symptoms. So having wearables, having, uh, you know, smartphone apps that you can use, having glucose monitors, things like that, that you can use that gives you that data as a patient or as a person, then you're able to actually make those, um, see those symptoms, how they relate to your data. And then you can, you can say, okay, well, my blood sugars are actually low. This is why I'm feeling this way. When I eat a certain type of food, I will feel better. 
And then eventually you will start to recognize those patterns yourself and you will rely less on the technology because you will understand your own symptoms and how your behaviors actually make those changes to how you feel as well. So that's a big part of it as well, right? You don't want to like rely only on the technology, only on the sensor, but you want to use it as a learning tool. You want to use it to capture that data to help you understand what's happening. And then you can make those choices yourself. So I'm going to, I'm going to go back just a little bit um, in a, in, for a personal example. So I won't go, I've talked about this on one of the other podcasts, but uh, my, you know, my kind of stumbling into the zone diet and uh, nutrition and nutrition for performance. And I, I, I tried one diet. It was, didn't work well. It was terrible. I was waking up hungry. I was sleeping like crap. Um, I shifted to 40, 30, 30 in terms of, you know, protein, carbohydrates and fats. And next thing I know, my performance starts getting better. My sleep starts getting better. Um, it, but when you, when now from the digital health perspective on this, one of the things, one of the earliest uh, wearable technologies was the heart rate monitors, the polar heart rate monitors. Now there may have right. been some prior to that, um, but I had, you know, I just kind of bought one of those and I was, you know, I was following uh, uh, Phil Maffetone, his, his, his training strategies for uh, what, you know, what he, um, but basically where he looked at uh, what your, your training heart rate was, you know, staying in, in, and nowadays people call it like zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five. But you know, back then they weren't calling it that. Um, so I was just, I was just, he called it the, the, the maximum aerobic function. There's a, there's a level in which your body is burning uh, fat for energy uh, versus glucose for energy and the different physio. If we were going to do this longer, we could go into this, you know, geek out about that a little bit, but um, you know, he had recommended people take fish oil because it helps to oxygenate the blood, which can allow you to train where you, where you can run faster at the same heart rate. So, uh, you know, in the end, it can impact your splits and your, uh, your, you know, improve your mile time. So every once in a while, like every three or four months, I used to run a five mile, a timed five mile and I would track my heart rate through that. Mm -hmm. And when I switched to, uh, the zone diet, uh, within a very short period of time, like three months, I, I took almost a minute off my mile split. So I was running at the same heart rate, uh, but my mm -hmm. times were faster. And I, if it wouldn't have been for the feedback that I was getting from the heart rate monitor, I don't know that I would have ever recognized that. And so that, you know, that's the kind of the positive feedback loop. I was like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. look at this. Like, my times are, my times are getting, I, I feel the same. I it don't, it doesn't really feel like I'm running faster, but mm -hmm. I'm running faster. My times are coming down, but my heart rate's staying the same. This is, this is bizarre. Um, so there in, in, from a, uh, I guess a wearable perspective, that was an early lesson for me. And it just kind of, again, so now I'm like, okay, well, what else can I do? You know, where else can I gain a little bit more data and a little bit more information to help me, uh, make decisions about, you know, at what I eat, when do I sleep? Mm -hmm. When do I train? When do I not train? Uh, and, exactly. Yeah. So as and I our move, bodies, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was just going to say that our bodies have those biofeedback loops built in. If we look at our neurological system, we have from our brain uh, into our peripheral nervous system, we have motor nerves that send signals to our muscles so that we can activate our muscles. And then we have sensory signals, sensory nerves that send signals back to our brain so that we have the feedback about not just how the muscle is activating, but what we are feeling, how our skin is contracting, how our blood vessels are contracting. All of that information gets sent back to the brain as well. And then the brain interprets it like a computer and it can make adjustments to our movements to, uh, you know, to how like the blood flow is flowing into the rest of our body so that we can make those adjustments. But we um, are not necessarily privy to how do we interpret all of those signals, right? Some of those signals we don't necessarily need to interpret. Uh, you would be overloaded with just way too much information. And that's why these are autonomic systems that run in the background without having our control in them. But having the data, like you're saying, 
to give us that feedback about what we can modify and then how those modifications are going to help us. There's a lot of new research coming out with um, biofeedback tools. And actually that was one of the focuses of my PhD research as well. I don't know if we talked about this last time, but basically um, my PhD research focused on creating a biofeedback system with an auditory cue to help people walk better and retrain how to uh, improve their walking after an injury or after an illness or when they were born with a neurological dysfunction to improve their walking pattern. So what we find is the auditory system and the motor system in our brain are very closely related. And so our brains naturally want to move to music. So we can exploit that system and apply an auditory cue when we actually want a person to sync up and uh, move to the music. So what we were doing for my research project, uh, for my thesis is we were actually taking signals from the muscles in the legs, analyzing them, looking at the alignment of the signals, when are they optimal, when are they not optimal? And then from those signals, we were sending an auditory cue through a smartphone app to a headset and we were giving people a rhythmic cue to help them align their movements and their walking patterns to this specific auditory movement. So that was the basis of my research project. And they were actually, um, we didn't end up commercializing my, my gate app, um, but there are other uh, research groups and there are other labs that are using the same types of principles for not only walking, but for athletics, um, for running, for breathing. So, and now with HRV as well. So you had mentioned HRV before, and now they're looking at how we can actually synchronize our breathing patterns with our heart, provide people biofeedback, on those breathing patterns, on their heart rate, so that we can align those two patterns and actually change the uh, increase the HRV levels, which means that we actually increase their health, we increase uh, their overall health, we increase their um, parasympathetic response, we actually lower stress levels. So that's one of the new areas of research within HRV, looking at how we can use HRV as a biofeedback mechanism. So big things happening in those spaces. So um, we have all of those systems built in and now we're learning how to exploit them with technology. So it's it's a way to assist how we understand our own bodies. That's how I like to think about it. There's been a lot of research at Purdue. Uh, with biofeedback? With biofeedback and and on working uh working on gait and injury prevention uh, for uh, particularly for elderly, elderly people, how to retrain after injuries, um, you know, which, you know, for, you know, in terms of like for public safety, it, you know, it makes a, it just makes a, a ton of sense. And, you know, even going back a little bit further, uh, you know, in the, you know, late nineties, the typical police uniform, you know, when you, when you came to work, when I, when I started working, you know, we, we wore polyester uniforms. We had leather belts, uh, the vest that we were wearing, um, very, very heavy, uh, not very pliable. So they were, you know, stiff and rigid. Um, but you, you had a, a, a radio that weighed, you know, close to three pounds. Uh, you had a firearm that weighed a lot, uh, but you weren't, you know, between your, uh, collapsible baton, a uh, firearm, a radio. You had a lot of weight that you were wearing um, in a very rigid belt that was right around your right around your waist, and you were climbing in and out of a car a lot. So when you talked about ergonomics earlier. Um, there was, and I can't cite the research on it, but when I was doing research at the time uh, on how do we make these things more comfortable, uh, more practical. A lot of left knee injuries for police officers <laughs> and mm -hmm. well well why uh well you know you police officers um you know you're looking at 60 to 70 percent of the policing population is overweight um you know it and there's you know and it's getting worse and then you add anywhere depending on the season anywhere from 20 to 30 pounds of gear on right. your frame and now getting in and out of a car 30 or 40 times a night, if not more, you know, that's left foot on the ground, pivot, turn, step out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and where's your holster on the left side? Well, it depends if you're righty or lefty. So, okay. 
You know, all, uh, you know, 10% of the, I, I can't remember the exact data on this, but about 10% of the of the world population is left-handed. Maybe it's 12%, something like that. Uh, see, I need, I need like a, an engineer sitting right here to look this stuff up as I'm yeah, saying. But, to give you all the data. <laughs> but, it, but you know, in the policing world, it's, it's close to 20% of police officers are left-handed. So yeah, it is mm -hmm. interesting to think about. I, I'm sure I know someone has, has studied it, but I digress. The point being, like from an ergonomics perspective, you, we saw a lot of left knee injuries and you see a lot of lower back injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, and, well, because you get in that car and, you know, that's that's a lot of pressure that's that's constantly, you know, being placed on your lower back. And now you start adding equipment, you know, mace, tasers, uh, mm -hmm. recording devices, uh, medical kits. Mm -hmm. if you know some people used to say like it's it you know it pays to be overweight because you have a bigger waist and so you can carry more stuff on your belt <laughs> uh, but for the but for the skinny people you know there's no room it's like where does everything go uh number right. one there's no place to go but it, we, you know we did interesting things back then we were just trying to find all right well you know, are not you know when i was in the service we wore web gear and we had uh harnesses uh, because mm -hmm. I carried, you know, two, you know, 240 rounds of, of five, five, six ammo in, in these pouches. And you wouldn't want to walk around with that on your hips all the time. And, and so you, we wore these harnesses that suspended the weight across your shoulders, equally, uh, you know, equal distribution. And I was like, well, why don't we do something like that in law enforcement? No, well, well, you've got the tradition of the uniform, you know, you don't want to wear right. anything. So, you know, it, it without going into all of that, it was, you know, we eventually, uh, you know, I, you know, wrote a proposal worked, we, you know, we put together a uniform committee. We talked, you know, we eventually got to the point where we shifted to external load bearing vests uh, that had Molly systems on them. And this was back in uh, around 2008, 2009, 2010 timeframe. Um, but there wasn't a lot of police departments doing that. A lot of, a lot of police leaders, uh, refused to do it just because they didn't like the look, the militaristic look of it. Um, mm -hmm. And, it, you know, so we get into these interesting conversations all the time in policing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, tradition over function, tradition right. over, you know, practicality. And it's like, okay, okay. Right. You want tradition to stand in the way of, uh, you know, a more productive workforce. Um, is it real? you know, is it, is it our own, uh, really limitations that we're putting on this uniform does the public really care if we're wearing an external vest or you know if we're wearing shiny buttons um right or, or do they care about our health and our well-being or do they care about quite frankly in the end how we're going to perform when they need us to perform and you know exactly. uniform and it's not you know it's not just the uniform right and that's kind of where i wanted to segue next is mm -hmm. that we, you know, we get, we get stuck. Sometimes we get into these mental traps. We box ourselves in and we say, nope, nope, you can't do that. And we tell ourselves why we can't do something instead of asking questions about why we should maybe rethink things. So, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm going to put your, your scientist uh, to the test here, your the scientist hat on and say, Let's go, let's go right at it. And let's just say in a case like George Floyd and uh, Officer Chauvin in, in Minneapolis, do you think that through science and data, things like that are preventable? Or I know it's kind of a trap question and it, I'm just doing it for fun, <laughs> but it'll get, it'll get us, to, it, it'll get... If we had wearable technology on on police officers, could we improve performance? I definitely think that there is um, a, a way to approach that situation and to uh, implement technologies to be able to monitor people so that they can be safe in the workplace, not just for themselves, but also for everyone else that they are to serve and protect. 
Um, one great example of this is actually the Department of Defense and Department of Energy. Uh, Scott Sonnen is one of the um, researchers uh, that's quite prominent in this area. And he uses a lot of wearable technology and he's actually building out a human performance analytics system to monitor um, uh, safety, monitor health data, in training while people are sleeping so that they can evaluate and, and actively monitor are people up for the job that they are doing? So can we track your stress levels? Can we look at your um, sleep levels? Can we monitor your heart rate and actually be able to tell when a person is in a high stress situation where their decision making will not be um, optimized or not be adequate to make good decisions or to react as quickly as they should? Um, are they going to be in a position where you know we can track things like whether or not you are coming up to getting the flu for example so looking at uh, health vital data we're able to predict within the next three days whether or not you will have the flu or have symptoms of the flu so we're able to predict before things happen that you are sick that you are going to make mistakes that something is going to physiologically happen to you that will not make you able to perform in your required role, um, whether it's through your health or through your work or through your athletic performance. So there are ways that we can build out systems to be able to monitor people in the workplace and be able to proactively say, well, hey, we're actually seeing that maybe your stress levels are consistently rising over a seven day period of time. Maybe we need to put in some interventions. The question, so with sensors, we are able to do that. We are able to build out those systems. The question is, does the industry want that? Do people in the workplace want to be actively monitored on an ongoing basis? Is it a privacy thing? Is it a safety thing? Um, how do people feel about having their health data monitored regularly? So I think that's one of the bigger parts of where we're at um, in terms of actually implementing these things and these types of systems. So in some fields like the Department of Defense, where there is a lot of control within those organizations, maybe it's easier to implement those systems and to be able to make those decisions. But in the public sector, I don't know, in law enforcement, in your experience, has there been a lot of pushback for implementing these types of sensors and actually having people monitored in the workplace, maybe well, not just from the decision makers, but also from your colleagues, right? Yeah, so I'm I'm going to give you two answers here. <laughs> the first answer is, um, well, one, there hasn't been, uh, I think, a big push to even try this yet. Um, okay. And probably the reason is, is because cops tend to be very protective of uh, their personal space and right uh good bad or indifferent the the reality is is that officers uh sometimes you know they're uh there there can be a mistrust uh between administration uh, you know from the administrative level down to the line level about what what data are we capturing and how is it going to be used uh and then primarily uh their main concern how might this be used against me and right. I don't. I don't say that because cops are paranoid. It's there's very good reason for police officers to have those types of concerns because if you're if let's just use the uh, uh, the Derek Chauvin example, uh, it, you know, it's kind of like a little test case here. If you have uh, wearable technology, and let's say we're going to track in his case, uh, we're going to track uh, respiratory rate and heart rate variability because what we're trying to do is understand is is his is he experiencing a high level of stress in the moment and then you know looking at hrv it, when he came to work that day was he in a uh you know a state of low recovery you know is his central nervous system stressed and and, and should should we have even put him in that situation to begin with because that's the exactly. kind of data that's the kind of data that you're starting to see and you're starting to recognize so you know the it's it's a fascinating question i think um yeah i wish i could give you a good answer there i think that there are some 
that would really want this in, this data and this information. But I think there are also limitations and there has to be some really good safeguards to be put in place because we don't, you know, in, on when you're on the street, you don't have any control often, to, despite what, you know, the general population might think. There are times where you have zero control over what happens. You are 100% in reactionary mode. Um, there is training, there is tactics, there are things you can do uh, to help mitigate uh, the risk of making a bad decision under stress or when you get caught off guard, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of one of these, this, this is a 10 hour podcast in and of itself, but, <laughs> you know, training office, you know, sometimes the public, why is the officer so robotic? Why, you know, why is it? Yes. You know, why don't they seem like they're human? Um, especially younger officers, right? Because we pound into them at the academy level about, you know, everything that might kill them when they go out to work. And, it's important stuff. And these are all things that we have to teach them because you would be negligent if you didn't teach them these things at the same exactly. time, at the same time, when you're talking about data and probabilities, uh, it's more likely that the paranoia that we're instilling in the, in this, in this training that we're giving them is going to lead to high levels of stress. And then over the long term, they're more likely to become obese and not because they like to eat donuts, but because, you know, they have ele elevated levels of cortisol and they're, they're craving sugars, they're craving energy and all these things that they, you know, physiologically speaking, they don't understand th this is the reaction to stress, but it, it, it's impacting them. So, yeah, it's kind of a long way of saying that thing, data like that, if we were tracking HRV, um, would, you know, would the officer themselves be in a position of, you know, maybe uh, would they, you know, be at risk of litigation for uh, being in a, in a low state of readiness? Would the agency be in a position uh, if, if you know, if we're tracking this stuff and we're aware of it and we know someone's got low, uh, you know, a low recovery score, but yet we still put them out where they might have to, you uh, engage in a high stress environment because, you know, any police officer, it doesn't matter how small or how big, where you are in America. I mean, it, if it's your day, it's your day, right? I mean, you, you could face uh, something extremely stressful and have to make a, a critical life or death situation. Um, and, and so, yeah, how is that, how, how would that data be used? Um, and, you know, quite frankly, it, it's, it's, it's one of the things, and I know we haven't talked about this, but it's one of the more disappointing things, um, you know, as a, as an administrator, it's like, you see a lot of things that you would love to do, but there is just a fear of doing them because of all of the questions that then, uh, start to be asked. And, and, uh, you know, you know, yeah, it opens up just so many different, uh, topics and, and concerns. And so you know, most chiefs, you know, rightfully so, are a bit risk averse when it comes to new plans, new programs, and things that we might do. Now, um, the the downside to being risk averse is is that there are things that we could be doing that could be improving performance, that could be saving lives, uh, that could be making communities safer, uh, but we but we don't do them, and so here in you know when you anytime you have new technology, something that's new man, it's a, you know, you're, you know, it really just takes a few to, to pioneer it and get it out and, and really kind of see what's going to happen. And, you know, people that are not necessarily risk averse and a, a great example of that is uh, uh, the taser weapon system, right. You know, and, and Rick Smith with taser, I mean, uh, imagine uh, being the first few police departments that are using this new, uh, you know, uh, this new taser weapon system that is, you know, it's, you know, it's not a, uh, a phaser from Star Trek, even though, you know, it's, <laughs> but it seems like that. Right. But, you know, are we, uh, you know, we're not shooting somebody with a bullet. Um, we're incapacitated, you know, but yeah, we're doing a, you know, a, a physiological incapacitation, um, you know, by having electricity, you know, travel across the body, not through the body. I'm not an expert. So if I said that wrong, 
don't come after me, people. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in the end, you know, but uh, the reason I bring that up is because, you know, early on in the use of the taser, there were so many critics. There were so many, there were stories that are coming out because uh, there were a few fatalities. And was it because of the taser itself? Was it a, uh, was it a medical response to the taser or was it, you know, something physical that happened as a result, like a head strike on concrete, something when someone becomes incapacitated. And so people, you know, it, the focus became how dangerous it is. But what people didn't ask is, well, how, how, how many lives are we saving by using this? Because what's the alternative to a taser, right? It's a bullet. And would you rather be tased or would you rather be shot? Um, well, neither, right? But if I put right. myself in that situation and then you're going to give me the choice, like I'll ride the lightning for five, you know, over taking, yeah. taking the round. Yeah. So exactly. Um, yeah. I, and this is where it takes like researchers and, you know, collaborations between researchers and law enforcement offices to actually put these pilot studies into practice, right? Take some yes. of the technology, develop a program, test it out and see actually how it can impact performance. What are people's opinions on it? How is the data being used? And, you know, not all of the data needs to be used. Maybe the uh, administrators, the chiefs are only getting some of the data that we're collecting. And then the rest of the data is actually only used on a personal basis by the officers. But then you need to roll out this entire program. It needs to be a holistic program where you have training on the technology, you have training on, uh, you know, the intervention. So because, you know, what if somebody sees that their HRV is super low or their heart rate is super high in a situation or their respiratory rate is really, really high? What do they do in those situations, right? There are training that needs to complement that data and say, well, if you are seeing this in your data, what does that actually mean? The data needs to be actionable for not only the individual users, but then also for the entire agency as well, right? So it requires you to implement a whole training program. It requires you to provide interventions. It requires you to, uh, you know, train people on those specific interventions so that they know what to use with the data. Uh, and then you're building out a whole holistic program that is then, you know, changing the whole face of how law enforcement is looking and what tools are we using in law enforcement? What are the uniforms looking like, right? You're bringing the whole law enforcement industry into the 21st century, into a futuristic um, perspective where we are blending with technology, where we are using those technologies as tools to help us better perform at our job. So it requires a whole shift in the thinking. It requires a whole shift in what it is we're training, because I know you do a variety of different training programs, but then you need to add the training programs that teach people, uh, the officers, how to actually use the data that we are collecting from the wearables. So it's a whole a whole dynamic shift. Awesome. And, and again, I, without going... Uh, down this rabbit hole, that is why it's so important for people to really think about why we need to invest in in research for public safety. And there has to be monies made available because in today's day and age where recruitment is way down, uh, retention is an issue. Uh, people are leaving the profession sooner than they ever used to leave. Um, we're seeing a cannibalization amongst uh, police departments around the U S I don't know if it's the same in Canada or not, but it, 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 we're offering these incentives to lure police officers from one city to another, one department to another. Uh, and all of these things are to try to solve the, the short-term problem of, I need bodies in cars out on the street today to respond to the calls for service that are coming in because, um, uh, Ever, you know, and since the post Ferguson days, since we've started to see this gradual decline, uh, the calls for service haven't stopped. The demand on police services have not gone away. In fact, that they've they've only gotten uh, more stressful, and that leads us to this point where we're where we're asking fewer officers to take more responsibility and do more. And, and I have this common theme where I talk about where we we 
underinvest and we overtask and you know and then expect to have great performance and and so mm-hmm. yeah so there has to be a, a complete holistic you know just a shift in our mindset in the way that we prepare and train uh, our our public safety officials and not just in policing i mean policing i think is where we're seeing the brunt of it right now but the uh, dod is another perfect example right and i think uh you know, we've we've had some discussions on this show where we've talked about the the military model, uh, and you know, I say it kind of flippantly, but you know, it's amazing where you know we can find twenty million dollars to ship overseas, just like that when we need to, or I'm sorry, twenty billion dollars and more. And I'm not saying it's not appropriate, but we never see that type of investment being made in in our own public safety officers in the U.S. I mean, we're you know we're underpaid. The salaries are really low. The training is is at a bare minimum. The equipment, just like you said, there is there there are very few research connections. We don't do this on, at a you know at scale like it needs to be done. And so when people talk about you know defunding the police, uh, well, you can't defund the police and improve performance. It's just not going to happen. Um, if you right. want better, if you want better performance, you really have to invest uh, in your policing. And and I think. With, with, you know, with the right technology and with the right training, I think eventually we, we probably can get to the point where we can have a, a better response and above better public safety apparatus and maybe and maybe do it more cost effectively, but it's going to require some investment up front. And so that's why I really appreciate uh experts like you being willing to to share your knowledge and your hard work to help us try to improve uh the policing profession and, and you know and in the end right we all benefit from that it's not you know that's kind of you know the, the calling side of things it's you, you don't join you know you don't become a police officer to become rich but um maybe financially but you do you know rich in spirit and rich in heart there's a lot of things that you get from this profession um so we really do appreciate it when when people are willing to help so I, you know, I want to like, you you said something a few minutes ago, um, and it kind of reminds me of a, of a story I was talking about because uh, I I worked with some folks at Purdue on a, uh, it's it's a, a really about a data visualization tool uh, in a, a Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence. It was called Vaccine, cool. and it's a really cool. It's a really cool tool, and again, it's it's using data to make better decisions, and that that's come a long way too. But uh, one of the things I found fascinating there was a uh, there's a book. It's called it's called Learning from the Octopus, and it's it's the subtitle is How Secrets from Nature Can Help Us Make Better Decisions About Our Security, and uh, written by uh, Rafe Sagarin, I believe is his name. He was a uh, if I'm, if I remember correctly, he was a marine biologist from Stanford, but he made uh, he made this analogy uh, back after 9/11 when we created this Department of Homeland Security, and we started pulling you know all the three letter agencies, the DoD, everything into a, like one central uh, yeah, yeah, agency where all the information came into one central point, which you know, on the surface seems like a really smart thing to do, right? Because some of the failures of 9-11 were, you know, people not sharing information, data, not making connections. But he also, he warned that he's like, you know, that's also can be very dangerous because if you have a central system and you have a catastrophic catastrophic failure, then nothing works, right? Where decentralization Mm -hmm. is, and, and he kind of used the analogy that everything that you can learn about safety and security can be learned in a simple tide pool in looking at mm-hmm. biological systems and mm-hmm. how bio, you know how a biological system will uh you know first and foremost the goal is is to survive and reproduce that that's mm-hmm. that's what nature does and he gave this example which I thought was fascinating but in the book like he's like you know take to take an example of two uh uh, two Roman soldiers or, two, you know, two knights in a sword fight, right? He's like, if you have these knights bashing each other, they're wearing armor and they're bashing each other with swords. And then all of a sudden, one of them gets his arm lopped off uh, with the sword. You know, he doesn't stop or he gets a big gash, I should say. 
he doesn't stop the fight and say, you know, brain activate, activate uh, blood clotting mechanisms, brain right. activate, activate antiviral systems. You know, he said, because if you, if you were stopping to make these decisions about, about a flesh wound, the next, the next cut that comes is going to be the one that knocks your head off. And, you know, yeah. and, and then the whole system is, is failed. And so, you know, when you you mentioned about the data points and, and about making decisions faster, you know, one of the things that we learned early on from Google, and he talks about this in the book too, was that the when when they started looking at data from the search engines, they found that they could accurately predict a flu outbreak uh, mm-hmm. uh, far more accurately and much faster just by you know looking at the data what people were typing in the search engines. Uh, typing in symptoms and and so where mm-hmm. where before the CDC was collecting data from hospitals and and right. retailers and everybody about, water samples even like water treatment samples they were measuring all of that right right and now and and so it's a long long way of saying look data there is a there is tremendous value in data but there is also tremendous value in having automation in systems that can give us as the individuals the information at a very uh at the earliest possible time to help us make decisions uh that are going to be the most beneficial or at least according to the data Mm -hmm. so i'll go back and answer the question could could the george floyd uh case been prevented i'm going to say yes I agree with that. I think if we had the the data to be able to track everybody's stress levels, to be able to track their health, their recovery, their sleep, then we would be able to predict in advance whether or not somebody will be able to adequately perform at the expected levels, be able to make those decisions, to be able to react to situations, to be able to stay calm in situations where they need to be, uh, you know, not aggressive towards um uh, towards a situation. So I, I totally agree with you. I think it is possible. And I think we are getting there. We are able to get there, uh, in a variety of other ways with, uh, the helps of artificial intelligence, machine learning. I mean, we can track ECG patterns from your heart with, uh, various sensors and we can predict when somebody will have a heart attack or some sort of cardiac event. We're able to predict in advance even just looking at HRV levels, whether or not somebody is going to fall and have a fall incident. So we're able to alert, uh, you know, call an ambulance, create an alert system that goes out. Uh, We're able to track patients with dementia, with neurological disorders, make sure that they're staying safe. These systems are being built. It just takes a while to build them. So all of the research is starting to get there. But it takes, you know, seven to 15 years for the research to actually be developed, the data to be collected, the algorithms to be written, to be tested, to be implemented, to be piloted out before it can actually get into um, commercial use or, or into the workplace where we can make these types of early decisions in the workplace and actually save people's lives, for example. So it's it's getting there, but we're not there yet. Not for everything. Okay, so we've mentioned HRV a few times, and maybe you know people in the audience might not know what that is. So can can you give us the uh, uh, the quick and dirty on what what is HRV? Sure. So HRV is heart rate variability. Basically, when we track the electrical signals of your heart, we get what's called a QRS complex. So if you imagine, you know, when you see uh, the signals of your heart coming up, it's kind of this multi-peaked pattern that has multiple peaks, QRS, and then it kind of flats, and then it gets these peaks. So what we do when we analyze that signal is we take the distance between the R and the next R peak, and that's called your RR interval. From there, we calculate the HRV metric, so the heart rate variability. How much does that RR interval change between each of your heart beats? And what we know is that in order to create adaptability in your system for your body to be able to adapt to these little changes that are happening throughout your entire body towards your environment and everything that's happening around you, 
your nervous system has to give your heart different signals through your autonomic nervous system um, to change your heart rate based off of what else is happening in your environment, internal or external. So that heart rate variability will actually change. So, you know, when you collect your heart rate, for example, and maybe 60 beats per minute, but the timing between each of those beats may be a little bit different. Usually it's around um, 500, 600, 700, 800 uh, milliseconds in between those heart rates. So if your heart rate is lower, typically your uh, variability will be a little bit longer, a little bit larger. And so that heart rate variability basically tells us how our nervous system is adapting to our environment. What we found through various research over the years is that basically we can use this heart rate variability to get insights into people's overall health. It can be used to predict whether or not somebody will um, um, be at risk of disease, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, flu, for example. Um, it can be a predictor or it can give us insights into stress levels, into recovery patterns. So there's different ways like HRV is a big term that actually incorporates a lot of different types of specific metrics. So when we talk about HRV, we're kind of giving it a broad umbrella term. But then when you actually analyze those RR intervals, there's different ways to analyze it. So you can look at the time signals of the intervals. What is the difference in the timing? What is the average difference of the timing? What is the root mean square of the timing? That can give us information about the general health of our heart, of our adaptability. Then we can look at the frequency component of the signal. So here we're doing different types of signal analysis techniques, and we're actually looking at the frequency components of that signal. So is there high frequency changes? Are there low frequency changes? Are there very low frequency changes? We can get a very low frequency power, a low frequency power, a high frequency power, and then we can calculate ratios of these different metrics. And those are the values that actually tell us what's going on with our parasympathetic nervous system or what's happening with our sympathetic nervous system. So the rest or digest or the stress response. And then we can look at balances between these two parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous responses. And so when you're talking about your recovery levels or your stress levels, you're looking at these frequency components of this HRV metric that comes from the variability between your heartbeats. And so based off of you know, where you are on these uh, different types of metrics, we can say whether your system, your nervous system is more stressed, or if that nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system is actually depressed and you're actually more in a recovery state. So we can look at those values typically during sleep. Then we get really clean ECG. There's less noise in the signal. So we are we get more accurate data when people are not moving, when they're sleeping. But we can also calculate those metrics in very short, uh, ultra short windows during uh, peaks of like daily activity, activities of daily living. So if you're, you know, um, in the workplace, if you're doing a call, then we're able to look at these very short windows of your HRV. And then we can say, well, typically your HRV levels are at this type of a baseline level, you know, maybe five or 10%. They kind of stay within this range. And then what we can do is we can look for sharp peaks or really low valleys in the signal. And then we can say, well, you're either above this threshold or you're below this threshold. And depending on if it's below or above, depending on the type of metric that you're actually looking at within this HRV signal, then we're able to say, well, uh, this is abnormal. There needs to be some sort of alert. So there are companies that have, for example, looked at um, tracking HRV levels, looking at uh, specifically for people with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and they track these HRV levels. And when there's a signal that's either really low or really high, what they'll do is they'll give them alert on their smartwatch. Their smartwatch will vibrate and it will tell them, hey, you should do this, um, this breathing technique. And then it will help uh, lower your heart rate and it will help reduce your stress levels as well and actually bring your HRV into a more normal phase. And the healthier you are, the more fit you are, 
your heart rate is able to adapt a lot better. So your HRV levels actually end up going up and then you're less at risk of developing uh, specific disorders, getting sick, et cetera, et cetera. So that's when you're kind of in the, the healthy zone. And what uh, some groups have done, um, actually groups from Russia, from the cosmonauts, they, they do this when tracking astronauts in the International Space Station. And what they've done is they've created this basic um, uh, structure to put you into a quadrant of health based off of your HRV levels. So they'll track your HRV levels over long periods of time, and then they'll look at the average HRV level and they'll put you into a bucket. Are you in a healthy bucket? Are you in a pre-morbid bucket? Are you in like a disease state? Or are you in like the, like you said, the red, green, uh, green, orange, or red state? So they kind of put it into four quadrants, but it's the same type of principle, right? Are right. you in a healthy state or are you in a, a diseased state, basically? And then they can track your HRV. They can give you uh, recommendations and then they can bring you back through that quadrant into a more healthy state. So um, heart rate variability, it's kind of an umbrella term the way that we typically use it when we're looking at smartwatches, consumer wearables. There is a lot more metrics to it, specifically based on how we calculate the HRV. But again, it looks at your heart rates, your heart beats. It takes the variability between the successive heart beats. And then we can analyze those signals based off of the time, the frequency, the spectral components of them. And then we can tell what's actually happening with your nervous system. We can take those values, we can relate them to your breathing patterns, we can modify your HRV, your responses based off of your breathing patterns. Um, and it can give you a lot of those good insights into what your recovery is like, what your stress level is like, what your overall health quality is like. So so for police officers, and I really appreciate that explanation, um, I think maybe a simple way for police officers to think about the, using HRV is there's a reason why professional athletes are using it. Um, they, they, and they've kind of been, you know, outside of some of the DOD, uh, NASA, and, and, and some of those applications where, you know, the science is really helpful. Right. And just, just the way you explained, it makes perfect sense. Right. We can, we can kind of put you, uh, we can identify pretty quickly what state of readiness you're in and, and how you might be, able, you know, and, and make a, it, it's not an, uh, uh, you know, an absolute, right. So, I mean, just because somebody might be, uh, in a, in a depressed state, uh, you know, in terms of HRE doesn't mean that they couldn't perform well under stress. They certainly could perform well, but they, you know, if you're a, you know, I don't know, the World Cup started today, right? So if you're looking at your team and the World Cup starting, you know, how, you want your people coming in at a high state of recovery and readiness. You don't want them coming in, you know, they haven't slept in three days because they're stressed out uh, and we haven't given them any type of uh, I don't, protocols or something they can do to, to you know, counteract that, you know, the, the, the stress that they may be feeling. And, you know, for you know, particularly when it, you know, when it comes to police officers, you know, stress can be very acute, right? It, it can be very, right. you know, one thing here, but so I, I think when we go back to the question, uh, you know, the big question that we're asking, can, you know, can data and biometrics, you know, help us predict poor performance in advance and give us an opportunity to intervene? Uh, and I think, you know, if, if you're asking again for absolutes, that that's a tough thing to do. But generally speaking, over over you know large data sets, can we move the needle in the right direction? And can we, you know, more importantly, I guess if if you're an individual, if if you're if you're seeing things like you have a low HRV, number one, you got to start to understand why. Well, why is it? Why is my HRV low? And what can I do to improve that? And then there are a lot of other metrics you can start to measure in between there. Um, but also having feedback from outside, I think can also give us really good uh, uh, information about what, you know, what interventions 
might be working, what they're not working. Might it, it might just be as simple as get more sleep. Uh, you're having trouble sleeping because you're working midnights. Okay, well, let's let's talk about your environment. Let's exactly you know, let's uh, if you're like me, you wind up in the basement uh, <laughs> in an area where there's no windows with a curtain drawn and a fan on and uh, as dark Extra and dark as, as as dark and as quiet and as cold. I can make it and cold. <laughs> yeah, dark. exactly. Um, and this is the thing, right? Like there's tons of different recommendations out there. There's lots of different concepts. Uh, there's lots of or there's. As Andy Galpin says, actually, there's the concepts are few, but the methods are many. There's lots of methods to achieve what it is we want. But like you said, you know, getting that baseline of data, understanding what your numbers actually are can be a good starting point for you to evaluate. Well, what is it that I do in my lifestyle? Like, what are my sleeping patterns like? Am I getting enough activity? Am I sitting at my computer all day and not actually moving very much? it forces you to kind of evaluate what the other data is because with things like a Fitbit, a smartwatch with um, even just, you know, there's lots of different um, like fitness apps that are built into smartphones that also track your data, your steps, your heart rate. You can use the camera sensor on your phone to track your heart rate. Uh, there's lots of different ways that we can track data and uh, our health data without buying any specific sensors or tools because a lot, of the, a lot of the sensors are already built into the smartphones. They're using vision-based um, apps to be able to track your, your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your HRV levels based off of just the blood patterns in your face, for example. There's a cool company out of Toronto that's uh, using that type of software. Um, it's called Anora. It's not a medical device, but they look at your vital signs. All you have to do is point the camera at your face. It takes a 30 second reading. It measures the blood flow in your face based off of their algorithms. And then it gives you all of this physiological data and you can run that completely free. You can measure it however you want, however many times you want. So it's super cool stuff. You don't have to buy any additional sensors, right? As long as you have a smartphone, you can use that with a smartphone with a camera, right? Most people have those. Um, so they can use free tools like that. Not a medical device again, but it is something that you can kind of track yourself. And then when you do go to your doctor's office, you can say, well, here's all of the data that I've been collecting. What do you recommend we start with? Right. It gives you that baseline. It gives you that starting point. You together with your doctor can work then with them to be able to get some sort of a plan together to be able to make those modifications. Maybe you do need to adjust your sleeping routine focusing on that sleeping hygiene. Maybe you need to make some adjustments to your diet. Those are all things that can be done. Maybe you need to move a little bit more, you know, starting with a basic exercise program to get a little bit more movement in throughout the day can make a big impact, not only on your stress levels, not only on your mental performance, but on your overall health and your lifespan as well. So your health span, your lifespan, all of that. And a lot of these things can be done for free, right? Sleeping is an adjustment that can be free, done uh, and, and made that's free. Breathing is free. Going outside for a walk is free. Doing some body weight exercises, you can do anywhere you are. There's even a new great study talking about um, glucose mod um, modulation using soleus push-ups. So for people who work at desks all the time, they recently did a study where they had participants uh, just basically do push-ups you know, with their with their calves, like do little calf raises while they were seated. And they found that that was able to regulate people's glucose levels. Uh, so, you know, something that might be very relevant that police officers can implement if they are sitting at a desk or if they are driving for people who travel a lot that are on planes, you don't really have an opportunity to incorporate or add exercise into your day to day. But there are little strategies that you can do based off of some of this new research, right, where we are trying to improve and get people to move more um, and move better throughout the day to improve people's health outcomes. So lots of things that can be done. Uh, and again, being able to collect that type of data really gives you that baseline and allows you to track how your changes, how your lifestyle is actually making a difference to your health. And that's a big empowering thing too, because sometimes you do these exercises, you do these things, and you're like, well, I don't really feel like 
working. But you're able to see with the with the uh, with the wearables, with the smartphones, with the digital health, how that does make a difference. And with things like breathing exercises, um, even just a simple box breathing protocol, you're able to see how your heart rate may be at 100 beats per minute before a presentation or before a webinar, before a podcast. And then with a simple, you know, two minute breathing protocol, you can literally watch your heart rate decrease and come back down to a more calm state. So those types of things, you can really see how quickly they work, right? And like you were saying with your with your running protocol, you were able to increase your running speed, your pace, and still maintain that same heart rate. And without the data, you wouldn't have really felt a big difference with it. So having the data helps and it empowers people to be able to continue with those choices. Oh man, we're just now scratching the surface of all these things. <laughs> all right, I got a couple more things. Um, okay. I want to be respectful of your time. So I want I want people that are listening to this. I, this may seem if if you're not familiar with the concept of respiration rates and HRV things like that, it may seem a little bit overwhelming. And so there, I want to break it down just to maybe some uh, a couple of you know simple principles. And I'll, I'll I'll go back and I'll talk about Fitbit data because this is where. Uh, ju and just tracking heart rate. Um, there, were, there was an officer on my department. He's he's been retired for several years now. He retired a few years before me. But he and I, we would get into these conversations about all kinds of different things. You know, cops were were really good about getting into interesting conversations with each other. But I was talking to him about the Fitbit, and um, he he wore a Fitbit, and then we were kind of having a conversation similar to this. We weren't I, I, HRV wasn't even on my radar at the time. And uh, he he hit me up one day. He's like, man, you got to see this. He's like, mm -hmm. he showed me his his heart rate data over a, a three day period. There was a, mm -hmm. a weekend that he worked and he looked at the, the weekend that he worked and then he compared it to a weekend where he was off, where he wasn't working mm -hmm. and he couldn't believe how much higher his heart rate was elevated the days that he was working I mean, we were talking mm -hmm. 25 beats per minute higher on average at, at a mm -hmm. so and and dr gil martin talks a little bit about this in his work right this is the state of the, the concept of hyper vigilance um a lot of police officers have become familiar with that term through his work but what you know, but when you see data like and he was talking about he's like you know this wasn't even like a busy weekend where he's like I mm -hmm. didn't I didn't have a car chase or a foot chase or uh, I didn't have a physical altercation. He's like, I it just, you know, for for a cop, you know, the run of the mill stuff, you know, you're going to car accidents where people are yelling and mad at each right. other, or domestic disturbances where people, you know, are, are upset with each other. Just seeing how high his heart rate would get in moments where he's not physically like he's not running, he's not fighting, he's not driving fast. That right. just just the body's uh, preparing itself for that, even though for an, ex, you know, a young officer, uh, you know, a, a recruit officer might experience those feelings as stress and where that that might now begin to interfere with their ability to make decisions. Right. They, you know, that when you mm -hmm. talk about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, uh, you know, when you get that amygdala hijack now, you know, the, the wall start caving in you start to get visual and auditory exclusion and it's it's easy to talk about stuff like this it's very difficult to get the general population to understand why uh you know why you know on average you know an officer engaged in a in a gunfight even though they train might you know their hit rate is going to be below 30 percent and and it's like well you're just not fighting your suspect, right? You're fighting your mm -hmm. own physiology in the process of it. So, you know, you have to go through training that prepares you uh, the right way. Uh, and that, which again is another topic, but what I'm, what I'm hoping that people will get from this show is I want them to get interested about this concept of wearable technology and uh, metrics that we can begin to track and then see how it impacts performance and see how we might be able to affect this in a positive way because that's how 
we're going to improve longevity for police officers. That's how we're going to reduce uh, risk of cardiovascular disease, of cancer, of Alzheimer's, all of these things post uh, their working career. Uh, but maybe most importantly, you know, that's how we're going to improve decision making under stress and and, and use the science to to guide our training and then use the intuition to help the science get better. And so it was it was really interesting just to, you know, just that conversation alone with one person made him look and then in mm -hmm. looking, you know, that changed you know, his outlook and his trajectory. And so the other, the other thing I want to talk about with HRV, uh, and I think this came from Don Moxley from Ohio state. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I heard him on a podcast and I want, I, hopefully I'm getting it. I'm getting his name, right. Uh, but he was talking about, um, you know, he's, he's a sports scientist and he worked with the wrestling program at Ohio state. And he actually got to a point where he was making predictions on future potential based on a couple of metrics. One was grip strength. Uh, the mm -hmm. other one was HRV. So, you know, Ohio State, one of the premier wrestling programs in the nation, they uh, he was doing measurements uh, as athletes were coming into the program, and he found that there was a correlation between high HRV, meaning high mm -hmm. variability, and mm -hmm. uh, high potential. And, mm -hmm. he, and these are, you know, you know, when you're comparing apples to apples and wrestlers, these are all the best in the country. They're all coming into the same wrestling room, but yet there was a couple of metrics that he could use to even identify among, you know, uh, the, the premier wrestlers, you know, who might have success and who might struggle. Uh, and one of the things that I thought was fascinating, and it really made me think a lot about policing was some people came in, they had very low HRV. They were very uh, physically fit, high-performing, world-class wrestlers that had very low uh, heart rate variability. And mm -hmm. he speculated, at least in part, that some of that might be because they're carrying emotional trauma, undiagnosed, unresolved emotional trauma that was... Uh, impacting the central nervous system's ability to recover. Yeah, that's very fascinating. Um, so I was going to ask, did he, like what other confounding factors or what other things did he look at in this study? Was it changes in nutrition? Was it sleep changes um, that he could kind of decipher what it was about the high HRV versus the low HRV groups? Uh, the emotional stress part, though, sounds very interesting. I, I haven't really explored that uh, specifically. I haven't seen any studies on that specifically, but that's definitely something I'm going to take a look at uh, in the next couple of days for sure, because I, now I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think ultimately the question really you know, stems from, you know, which would be the same thing in policing, right? If you were if you were able to detect something like that or measure it, OK, well, you know, can you improve performance by improving HRV? And maybe the more basic or simple question is, can you actually improve your HRV and do it in a way uh, that, you know, that's going to be um, meaningful in a perform, you know, from a performance metric, uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe if somebody, you know, and we're talking like, he said some of these athletes had HRVs down in like the twenties, which is, oh, wow. which is really low for some, for high your... performing athletes. Yeah, no, I'm my earbuds keep falling out. So I apologize. But uh, <laughs> they're okay. okay. They're okay. I can still hear you. Um, no, I was gonna say, actually, like I've tried to, um, to find normal values for HRV, because one of the things that we we do in neurology is we have specific tables of normal values, you know, a healthy nerve is basically anything above uh, 40 milliseconds or 40 meters per second for a velocity in the upper limb is greater than 50 meters per second for a velocity. Then we look at things like amplitude, uh, the lag between the different signals. So there's different components, characteristics of the signals that we look at to determine the nerve health. So I thought, well, what are the normal values for HRV? Because here I am tracking my own HRV, but I don't actually know, is this a healthy value? Is it a you know, a good value relative to like a typical population. And then what are the HRV values for athletes? Because 
you know, I'm not a competitive athlete, but I do like to train. I do focus on living a healthy lifestyle. I do my breathing exercises. I've got my sleep hygiene. I eat a clean diet. You know, I'm always trying to train for something like yourself as well. I call it training for life because I always want to be prepared for everything. So, right on. Um, you know, I took a look at the HRV normal values in the research that I was able to find. And I was actually quite surprised that uh, for a typical female uh, between the ages of 30 and 35, my age group, the normal values are only between 35 and 40. So they're actually quite low. And then when I look at some of the data that, for example, WHOOP is releasing, a lot of their data comes from the, you know, athlete groups. Some of them they're reporting in 80s, 90s, 100s, 120. So I'm like, well, what what does this mean? Like, is our healthy population that low in terms of the HRV values? Or is that the subgroup of the population that we're monitoring? Is it differences in how we're collecting the data? You know, why are those normal values so low for a typical population? And like even what you're saying, uh, an HRV of 28, is that low or is that considered sort of normal for a healthy regular population versus an athlete population. So there's lots of things that we still need to kind of explore in that uh, in that area. One of the one of the difficulties is that the data collection is not standardized, right? Yeah. So we use different sensors to collect the data. We report different metrics off of this data. Um, and it's hard to make those conclusions because the data is all different. So there are groups that are now trying to, you know, create standards for health data, uh, for digital health, for how we should be collecting this data so that we can, you know, evaluate and compare, accurately compare between different studies, between different pa patient populations, uh, between different clinical interventions, for example, so that we can make better recommendations because the data is more standardized and we can accurately compare it between these different studies. Because when you take a look at these studies, like I said, you know, one group is reporting on this metric, another group is reporting on a different metric. And then you're like, well, what do I recommend for my participants or for my team or for my patients? Because all of the data is kind of giving us different results. So um, we're still at an early stage, I think, with the HRV, where we don't have those types of standardized methods of collecting data, of analyzing the data. I mean, the analysis part is more, more standardized, but again, when you're using different sensors, are you getting different results because you're using different sensors? I don't know. We're kind of, we're kind of early still, but there is, you know, when you're looking at your own data, you're still able to, you know, the value is that you still can make relative, uh, you can look at the data in a relative way. So instead of comparing your, yourself against somebody else, you can compare within yourself. So tracking your own data and having uh, a trend in that data to be able to say, well, this week I was working on the weekend. My data got really high. My heart rate was very high. My HRV was really low. It was a stressful time, even though I didn't really feel stressed my body was in a state of stress, my body, you could say, was in a state of fight or flight to be in that vigilant, you know, situation so that you are prepared for those types of situations that you may encounter in the field um, versus a weekend when you're not working, you can, you know, evaluate your data and say, well, on the weekend, I actually went for a long walk. I had a really good sleep. My diet was consistent. I wasn't overly stressed about anything. And then you can see the differences in your own heart rate, in your own HRV values. You can track the changes within your own data. So even though we're not able to make may maybe necessarily great recommendations just yet in terms of what are the normal values, where should we be, it's still good to be able to track within our own data to be able to see how our choices affect that data, how the training affects it, how the nutrition, how the sleep affects it, how that emotional stress may affect it. Because then when you maybe do an intervention and that uh, athlete does apply some sort of technique um, to try to work on their emotional stress, then maybe we will see that HRV level increase, right? So yeah, really interesting stuff to explore. Um, a lot of value, a lot of value that it can bring to people. Um, and help them make healthier choices at the, you know, at the end of the day. 
Well, I, I definitely, you know, big shout out to a coach that I worked with because he, yeah, he was the one um, that recommend that I wear, start wearing a whoop strap. So it's been, a, it's been a couple of years now and, uh, and particularly for those things. So I could begin to understand you know, what my personal behaviors and what I, the choices that I were, that I, that I was making and, and continue to make how they impact. So I can tell you that, you know, one of the things I want to close with for today, or maybe, maybe just a couple of things that we can do that are actionable to move us in the right direction. I can tell you with relative certain, the two things that, that you shouldn't do. And a lot of listeners may not want to hear this because I even hate telling it to myself because they, right. And I recently listened to uh, uh, the Huberman Labs podcast. If people don't listen to that, that's, that's just amazing. But uh, he did a show on on alcohol use, and, and you know, I'm not uh, a big yeah. drinker. You know, I, I, you know, in my college days, uh, you know, I could hang with the best of them. But you know, when you when you when you have kids and you're working midnight, I worked midnights for um, a long time. You know, I either comp you know combination of nights or afternoon shifts. Uh, uh, for a better part of 15 years, really, really closer to 20. But the, uh, the two things that I found that personally impact me, uh, in a negative way, the most are number one is alcohol use. Uh, if you want to see your, your recovery plummet, um, drink, um, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then don't sleep. So I was yeah. going to say, you said my highest recorded HRV that I've had is 78. I'm 55. Um, nice. The lowest I've had is six. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So I wonder, so- you know, the six was on a, on a weekend where I did work out and it was a family wedding, you know, yeah. I worked out before we went and then I stayed up late, drank a lot, had, you know, dance, had right. fun. And I was right. like, oh my God, does that mean I was like close to death, you know, being you know, <laughs> at six? So I don't, I don't encourage people to do that, but uh, with that in mind, and let's close it with this. Cause I want to, I, I think we've gone over, I knew we would, but um, maybe <laughs> what are a couple, what are, if we just focus on just a couple of things that people can do. And I know you've said this, you've said this to me offline is that from a scientific perspective, exercise is the most important thing that people can do. So maybe let's just, let's just leave it at that and say, and maybe an explanation as to why, and then we'll have to come back and, and do another show later about, um, you know, get into maybe a little bit more of the details. For sure. For sure. So I would actually say two things, exercise and sleep. Those are the, the foundational things. Uh, physical exercise, we know it builds cardiovascular strength, muscular strength. It increases blood flow to the brain. So it helps to stimulate and keep your brain healthy, keep your brain at a working capacity. It prevents cognitive decline. Uh, so we know that exercise is helpful not only for your physical body to maintain muscle mass, to maintain muscle strength, to maintain a good working heart, a strong heart. Um, but it also helps to keep your brain healthy and strong as well and prevent some of those natural declines that we get with aging. So we get to a point usually, um, depending on the literature that you that you read, depending on whose study you read, uh, we start to experience aging declines around 25, 30, 35 years old. And with in in terms of the uh, the muscle loss, we experience about a one percent muscle loss per year. And in terms of muscle strength, we experience between one to 5% in strength loss per year. Is so that like physical after, after age 35 or when does that, is there, is a hard, yeah. is that 30, 35, 40? So if you read literature in terms of the, um, uh, like growth and maturation, they'll say that typically men will start on their aging decline after about 28, 30 years old. Um, some researchers will say 35. Other researchers, Stu Phillips was one of the uh, McMaster researchers who's big on aging and, and muscle mass and muscle strength. He does a lot of research in that. I recently heard him talk on a podcast saying 35 is probably the, the peak where we kind of increase our growth and then we kind of plateau for a little while before we start to see that um, aging related decline. And like I said, 1% decline per year in terms of the muscle size, but about 3 to 5%, up to 3 to 5% in terms of muscle strength. So we know that physical exercise can prevent that aging decline, 
But we also see the same thing happen with the brain. So if you're not exercising the blood flow, you're not bringing new nutrients into the brain, you're not supporting those, uh, the growth and the replenishment of those tissues. So um, the exercise will help to maintain that muscle mass, to maintain that cognitive function, make sure all of the areas of the brain are getting worked at. So, you know, those things can be helpful, not only when you're working a physical type of job where you do need to, you know, be uh, going to situations where you may have a foot foot uh, chase or you may have like a car chase or anything like that. Uh, but it also can help for people who are doing desk jobs as well. So making sure that they're able to process, making sure that they have good memory, making sure that they have good reaction times. And the exercise can also help you upregulate and downregulate your nervous system. So when you're training in an exercise program, you learn how to control your nervous system. And that can also translate as a skill into the workplace as well. So when you are in those high stress situations, because you've trained in terms of exercise, you're able to also maintain lower levels of um, uh, nervous system to down -re regulate your nervous system. So you're not in such a high stress situation or so that your, you know, your cortisol levels aren't that high, but maintain that calm in a stressful situation or in an emotionally charged situation. But it can also help train us up to upregulate our nervous system. So when we do need to react really quickly, our bodies are more able to react quickly to those situations as well. So exercise overall can help with our heart health, with our muscle health, with our cognitive health and performance as well. So overall, uh, you know, any sort of movement is good. The more movement you can get throughout the day is better. The American Medical Association recommends about 150 uh, minutes of aerobic exercise, uh, so walking, jogging, uh, cycling, anything like that per week, and it has to be at a at a bigger or a moderate intensity. Otherwise, you can do about seventy five minutes of more vigorous intensity exercise. So you do want your heart rate to go up so that you are training your heart rate to be able to function and work at those higher levels as well. Uh, or you can do a a combination of both of those. Uh, intense, vigorous intensity exercise, moderate intensity exercise. So if there is one thing that you can take away, movement, move more, move daily, find somebody to move with you. Uh, even if it's, you know, a 30 minute walk in the morning, uh, a bit of strength, uh, strengthening exercises in the evening, doing some static stretches throughout the day, getting up out of your desk. All of that activity builds up throughout the day and it all counts as those active minutes. So if you do have a Fitbit, if you do have a different type of smartwatch, those are great for tracking steps. That's something that you can set as a goal for yourself as well. So it, again, empowers you, it encourages you to create that goal, uh, to maintain that, that goal on a daily basis. You can track your trends over time as well. So um, overall, you know, getting into a, a better exercise routine, a daily exercise routine uh, is really great for your physical and your mental health. And it also helps you deal with those stressful situations, whether they're in the workplace or in your life. Um, and it can help increase your health span and your lifespan. And then in addition to that, you know, when you do exercise, when you do have stressful situations in your work and your life, you also need to take the time to recover. So getting that good sleep, optimizing uh, your sleep hygiene, your sleep habits. I think my headphones just died. So <laughs> let me know if you can still hear me. Can you still hear me? Yeah, you're cutting out. You're starting to fade a little bit, but you can oh, okay, finish your thought okay. and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, maybe the sleep can be a different discussion for another time, but, you know, you do need to recover. Your body does need to take time to recover to uh, replenish those, those hormone levels, to rebalance your hormone levels, to clean out the junk that's been built up in your brain over the course of the day, um, to build up your muscle tissue that has been used throughout the day, to, to regulate all of those processes. And your body takes a specific amount of time in order to be able to do that. Otherwise, this junk builds up and then it can lead to things like uh, Alzheimer's, like dementia. And those Unfortunately, those diseases are ones that take a long time to build. And then you don't get the symptoms until about 30 years later. So it's really like everything that you do 
in the 20 to 30 years before you're, say, 60 years old, that really makes the difference for when you are 60 years old. Does it mean that there's not time if you are uh, older to, you know, put in some uh, prevention methods to try to fight some of those things, some of those bad habits that maybe you've had over the over your lifetime? Exercise is a great one. And then sleeping and recovering is the other one to complement that. So I think my headphones are about to die. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Well, thanks. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great that you say that because one of, uh, uh, I, I heard this expression just here in the last few days too, in terms of the, the science now in terms of cumulative effects of a good protocol, a good healthy protocol, like nutrition, like sleep, like exercise. It's very similar to the laws of compounding interest, uh, for those that are financially uh, oriented, like, you know what, if I start saving in my twenties, that's going to be far better for me in the long term than if I start in my thirties. But if I start in my thirties, it's still better than not doing it at all. Um, You know, even starting in your forties and fifties, the point is that it's never, it's never too late to start. Um, Just, you know, you have to be realistic about what you're, you know, reach, you have set realistic goals when you do start. But the the point is, is that don't wait, um, you know, get, you know, start looking at the data, start finding ways uh, to, you know, start exercising, uh, improving nutrition, improving sleep. Uh, it's all, it's all gonna, it, it all adds up in the end and it, you know, it can make a huge difference. And, you know, for, for police leaders, the, uh, and everybody is a leader, but, it, but what I'm, you know, for administrators in particular, uh, you know, don't be afraid to, to look for people like Dr. Catherine Plua and partner with, uh, with them in terms of building research that can improve the profession. Um, you know, being in a university town here, it's, it, you know, I've found that, uh, researchers love to work with public safety. There's a lot of things, you know, and not just because of the, the things that they can learn in the data, but they want to do it because they know it's going to make a difference and be impactful uh, for their communities. Um, so look look for people that can help. Um, don't be afraid to, you know, get out on the, on the edge a little bit to try some of these things. Uh, you know, in the end, what we're trying to do is improve performance. Uh, and through improved performance, we're improving health. Uh, and we're improving outcomes and, you know, what more could we ask for? So with that, Dr. Kat, thank you very much. I really appreciate you spending uh, your valuable time with us. Um, Episode two is going to be on uh, a more in-depth dive on HRV and then sleep and how that impacts it. And then we didn't even, you know, we didn't even brush the surface on nutrition, but that's, that's that's like, (laughs) that's like getting lost in the jungle sometimes. So. That's right. Well, thank you very much, Pat, for having me. I look forward to a follow-up discussion. And um, yeah, I'm, you know, in any way that I can help, I'm I'm here to help. So uh, if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Well, how can people get in touch with you? Good question. Uh, my website is enterprisestressmanagement.com. My contact information is on there, or you can find me on LinkedIn. Enterprisestressmanagement.com or Dr. Catherine Plua. P-L-E-W-A on LinkedIn. Great conversation. Can't wait for the next one. Thanks everybody for listening. And uh, for now, we're out. Log into www.performance-protocol and learn more about how to bring this program to your agency and community.